In the week that the long list of the Nio Marsh Awards is announced, we celebrate the woman herself, who's just released her latest crime fiction novel, 36 years after she died. Not bad going, that. This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. Well, Bob, I used to think that uh, Fridays couldn't come round quickly enough, and then I decided to start producing a weekly podcast. Yes. And now they seem to be coming round every five minutes. Every day's a Friday. <laughs> Lots of work goes into producing the podcast that people just just don't see. But uh, well, I don't see it either because uh, you know you're the the the, the gizmo man, and uh, I just come here and uh, and talk into this microphone and have a chat with you and our, our wonderful guests, and and then I go home. Well, this bit's lots of fun. This is this is this the fun bit, bit. Is the fun bit, but it yeah. is a lot. Of, listeners, it is a lot of hard graph. People who know how this sort of thing is done will uh, uh, know only too well uh, how much time and dedication it yes, takes. Well, gluttons for punishment, deciding to do it weekly. But there we are. We'll, well, uh, we'll carry on. We do we enjoy said, it. We said we could do it when we wrote in. But in in the um, the little bit of downtime I have had in the last week, on uh, Sunday evening, I settled down to watch Midsummer Murders. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> which was particularly. <laughs> Particularly intriguing this week, up. dear listener, because the man <laughs> sitting next to me was uh, was one of the guest stars. Uh, yes, uh, and even more amazingly, you seem to know what you were talking about when it came to plants. D- well, you see, this is it. This is this is this is great acting, Adam. <laughs> as, as you know, I mean, they, they, my character is a, uh, a sort of a, runs an artisan gin um, business and whatever, and he's got lots of and he's got lots of flowers in his greenhouse. So, yet yeah, the script uh, was very helpful. It gave me all the names all I had to do was learn them and and look as if I was a little bit Monty Donish uh, <laughs> which uh, hopefully I, I pulled off but as you well know you are a green fingered swine yourself so you're an expert on this sort of thing I know next to nothing about <laughs> I, I mow the lawn uh, and that's about it it did give me a chuckle when I, uh, I realised who your character was but <laughs> well I have actually, of course someone tweeted the other day and said I did do an episode about uh, ten years. Uh, well, two thousand six. That's longer than that. And uh, they tweeted saying, uh, "Robert Dawes Midsummer Murders in two thousand and six. He's drowned in red wine, and he's back in two thousand eighteen making artisan gin. What's the connection?" <laughs> I think I can answer that one. <laughs> um, and also, I did have a bit of extra downtime because I did go away for a few days last week. Um, there were a few days in the sun, and I started reading um, a book on this era of voice, my uh, Kobo Aura which I can highly recommend. Uh, it's called The Escape by C.L. Taylor. Um, you haven't got one? Don't? Oh, they, they only send one to the, to the main host. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's um, The Escape by C.L. Taylor, which I can, um, I, I can attest is um, just a, a, an excellent book. It's, um, I mean, gripping doesn't really cover it, to be honest with you. It's, it's one of those books that you, you, know, you start to, to read and you... You think, oh, I'll just I'll just do one more chapter, one more chapter, and, and before you know it, you're you're you know you're at two o'clock in the morning or something like that, or you. It draws to... you in and it spits you out. It absolutely it? does. Yeah, it's um, just just so well um, so well written, really. Um, I've never heard of C. L. Taylor. Am I am I wrong to? Have, is, is this your first? Um, it's it's the first one I've read. Yes, of of hers. Of hers yeah, it's um the, the 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 synopsis is when a stranger asks Joe Blackmore for a lift, she says yes, then swiftly wishes she hadn't. The stranger knows Joe's name. She knows her husband Max, and she's got a glove belonging to Joe's two-year-old daughter Elise. What begins with a subtle threat swiftly turns into a nightmare. And it's um, yes, it certainly does. It, it picks up pace so quickly, and just when you think it's uh, flying along, it uh, it shifts into a higher gear once again. So um, I can highly recommend that from Kobo, The Escape by C. L. Taylor. Right, and it looks very nice on that device, Matt. I say yes, it does. Yes, with with absolutely no 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 envy in that last statement of mine at all. <laughs> uh, well, now my my uh, recommendation, uh, crime fiction lovers everywhere, uh, this week is isn't a book, um, and uh, it was uh, on television last week, um, and it was called Innocent, uh, written by yes. uh, uh, Chris Lang, very well known for his series uh, Undeniable and Unforgotten, starring Nicola Walker and Sanjeev Bhaskar, uh, two great series uh, there, uh, and but this is a, a, a piece, a series. 
Rose. He he uh, wrote with uh, best-selling uh, crime uh, novelist Matt Ulrich, um, and it's absolutely cracking. It's got a great cast. Um, Lee Ingleby plays a, a a man who's been in prison for seven years, uh, convicted of murdering his wife, and is acquitted on a technicality. Uh, though, uh, and is determined to prove his guilt. And it was run over four nights on on ITV, uh, which was I'm, a great way of doing it. I mean, I've never watched consecutively over 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 four nights. I never but, had uh, four nights three in a row. Well, no, you do have a young child in that house. <laughs> but it's it's fantastic. I've been watching that myself, in fact, and I think it's the only time so far in 18 odd episodes that um, one of us has brought up a book or a TV programme and the other one's actually seen it. Seen it? it, it, (laughs) The the Venn diagram is complete. Well it just shows listeners the range that we cover Mm. that uh, we we don't usually double up. It's a great series and I mean Matt Arledge's um, involvement is is clear. He's a fantastic writer. writes under MJ Arledge and he's um, yeah he's a fantastic Well I met him uh, briefly at uh, at Granite Noir and uh, and he was just lovely and gave a a, a brilliant uh, talk up there. But it is is great and what a sensational cast. You've got uh, Hermione Norris, you've got uh, you've got uh, oh god what's his wonderful name Adrian Rawlings. Marvellous actor was one of the first actors in The the Woman in Black. Uh, Yes. uh, You've got Nigel Lindsay who Who's uh, in everything at the moment, and deservedly so. I mean, he's uh, he's absolutely terrific. It's a, a superb cast and a lovely ensemble, but it's beautifully written. Uh, keeps you on the edge of your seat, does it not? Mm. Uh, right to the to, to the very end, and is well worth catching up on your catch up. Um- I'm going to do something I don't normally do on this show, and I'm going to oh. plug my own book, mainly because it's out in a few days. Said, oh, good. Um, of Didn't course. what you're going to say then for a second. <laughs> well, as a listener to Partners in Crime, you uh, may well be aware, unless this is your first episode, in which case, welcome. At, um, as a listener to Partners in Crime, you get an exclusive 90% off of your first ebook purchase from Kobo. All you need to do is go to kobo.com and enter the promo code CRIME at the checkout. But... On top of that, um, I have a discount code at Kobo, which they very kindly set up for an exclusive offer. Um, my uh, eighth Knight and Culverhouse book is out next week on the 30th of May, the eighth one in the series. And what is it called? It's called Dead and Buried. And to celebrate that, every other book in the series, including the box sets, are available at Kobo with a 30% discount. So that's uh, all nine titles so far. That's um, seven standalones and two box sets are available with 30% off only until June the 9th. That offer is now open. It's available worldwide and you can use it for every single book if you like. You get 30% off the whole series. The code you need at the checkout for that at Kobo.com is K and C8. K-A-N-D-C and then the number eight. Night Culverhouse. Enter the world of Night Culverhouse. I mean, yeah. it's a fantastic deal you're offering there. Well, for a set, set of uh, of great books. So yes, yeah, or use get, your Kobo discount. Yes, get stocked up on those, and you'll be you'll be ready for for book eight. Great. Uh, can I have my fiver now, please? Thank you. Um, <laughs> is, uh, it, is that not your read of the week? Uh, yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. Well, actually, I will catch up with that because you you know I love your your, your books. But uh, we've got uh, uh, lots of other books to cover in this edition yeah. of Partners in crime we are talking to we have got two fantastic guests mm. uh, this week um uh, who've got lots of information and uh and there's a sort of um southern hemisphere vibe going on this week there is uh as we talk to craig sisterson and we also talk to the amazing stella duffy both passionate uh, advocates of uh of the crime writing uh and uh in particular uh kiwi crime writers uh <laughs> Uh, and uh, and they'll explain more about it uh, in yeah. the next few minutes. But uh, well, this is a Nio Marsh special. This is a it's, Nio uh, Marsh special. Kind of come about by the, the two guests that we have. Yeah, Craig Sisterson, who um, runs the the Nio Marsh Awards. Um, for best uh, New Zealand crime writing or crime connected Amongst writing. many other things. Um, and, and a wonderful speaker. He's uh, He'll be our guest for the first half of the show. And in the second half of this Naomi special, as Bob says, we'll be speaking to Stella Duffy, who's um, our first OBE we've had on the show, I believe. She indeed. She's um, and, and <laughs> well deserved as well. She's an absolute powerhouse. And uh, she'll be speaking passionately about uh, Naomi Marsh and about uh, money in the morgue. 
which was the, the book that I spoke about in the introduction, which Nye Marsh started during the war and then abandoned and has now had finished and, and released it's 36 called, years yes, after her It's death. called conti- a continuation novel. Ah. Uh, I think there are about three or four chapters that Nye Marsh, Dame Nye Marsh, uh, wrote and, and left it, and uh, Stella Duffy... Uh, picked up the, the gauntlet thrown to her by uh, a publisher and has finished it off uh, splendidly. Uh, the reviews have been absolutely fantastic and uh, and it's out now. But she'll also be talking about her own psychological thriller, The Hidden Room, and all about her theatre work too. She's a fantastic theatre yeah. maker. So on to uh, our first guest, I think. Should we crack on? Um, yeah, what's the time? Yeah, why not? Well, here we have our special guest, uh, one of our special guests today, a critic, reviewer and crime fiction specialist mastermind, also the founder of one of the best, I have to say, uh, crime fiction blogs I have read, and also founder of the Dame Nea Marsh Awards. Now, the Dame Nea Marsh Awards uh, are presented annually in New Zealand to recognise excellence in crime fiction, mystery and thriller writing, and here to talk about those, himself and crime fiction in general, is the marvellous Craig Sisterson. Craig, back by popular demand. We had a lovely chat with you up at Granite Noir uh, a few months ago, and uh, as I came back from there, I said to Hugh Fraser, and I got back to Adam, I said, we've got to get him on the show. He's a mind of information and hugely entertaining, so welcome to Partners in Crime. Well, thank you very much, Bob. I'm going to have to get you to do all my introductions forever, anywhere. I think after that, so. I listen. You, 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 you took our our paddle up in uh, in Aberdeen, and um, well, I take that as a lovely compliment, especially coming from you, because you're very good at this sort of thing uh, yourself. So now you are a, a New Zealander living in uh, the UK, in London. You are a crime fiction aficionado, um, a great um, expert on it. You uh, have fingers in lots of pies. Um, uh, You work in Scotland, you work all over the world, actually. But uh, this week has been a particularly special week for you because of something you founded in 2010. Would you like to tell the listeners a little bit about that? Yes, thanks very much, Bob. As you say, I, I kind of spread myself around a little bit. People everywhere kind of uh, might get sick of me, but uh, I love talking about crime books. I love books in general. And and as you say, um, this week's a little bit special because we've just on Tuesday announced the long list for our 2018 Nio Marsh Award for Best Novel, which, as you said in your intro, is is our award for crime mystery and thriller writing in New Zealand. So our equivalent of, of the Daggers or the McIlwenny Prize or the Edgar or something like that, but um, for the New Zealand authors. Fantastic. So, uh, you, you, I mean, some people will, uh, many people will actually already know the news, but there may be many listeners to Partners in Crime who don't. So can you tell us anything about this year's uh, awards? Yes, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, the, the awards have been growing each year. We, we started uh, back in 2010 because we thought there was a space to, to celebrate our New Zealand crime writers who perhaps weren't getting recognised by our general books awards in New Zealand, but we were getting more and more great crime writers coming through. So like like the uh, the Scottish starting their crime writing prize now called the McIlwenny Prize or Canada with the Arthur Ellis and Australia with the Ned Gallies, we realised that New Zealand was perhaps uh, the only English-speaking country that didn't have a crime writing award, but we did have lots of great crime writers. Um, or Belize. Belize may not have had a crime writing award as well. Um, but, but outside of Belize, New Zealand was the only English-speaking country that maybe didn't have a crime writing award. And we had lots of great crime writers. So we started back in 2010. So this is our ninth year. Um, very exciting. We've grown. We've added a first novel prize. We added a true crime um, or non-fiction prize last year as well. But this long list announced on Tuesday is for our, I guess you'd say, our open or main award, the Best Novel Prize. And we've just announced um, 10 long listies on Tuesday. We had a record number of entries, um, more 66 entries this year. So crime writing was going great guns in New Zealand. And um, if you don't mind, I, I can run you through the entries. of. Oh, sorry, the long listies. That um, would be they... smashing. Would you mind? That would be great. Yeah, fantastic. So we, as I say, we have... Um, 10 long listies, and they're a really glittering um, array of writers in a number of ways. I'm very excited about this long list because we have some 
award-winning writers who've won awards in different countries. We have some brand new first-time authors. There's a couple of debutantes who've actually made the long list for this for our open or open award, so to speak, as well. There's a separate award for debuts. Um, and uh, and we've got a couple of authors who've come back to crime fiction after more than a decade away. So it's wow. a really interesting mix. Um, we also, I think our youngest author on the long list is 21, perhaps 22 now. And the oldest author on the long list is 82. So we have a great spread of like... I love to hear news like that. That's great. Yeah. Young and old, still at it. I love it. There's yeah. hope for us yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the 21-year-old. So, um, <laughs> I'll run through alphabetically and uh, randomly, I've just realised looking at it, uh, alphabetically, we have um, five men and five uh, women writers, and it seems to be the five men first and then the five women, just the way the alphabetical names work. But don't worry, we have some amazing female writers that I will get to down the list. <laughs> so, we'll, so, so we'll start off, we have The Easter Make Believers by Finn Bell. Now, um, this is Finn's third novel. It's a, uh, it, it has um, a hostage situation with a family taken hostage and a couple of cops in the southern part of New Zealand down in Otago attend and then everything goes wrong like everything that could go wrong goes wrong with the hostage situation there's explosions people missing people die it's all really bad and they've got to investigate the aftermath and it turns out that the hostage takers were all gang leaders from a local gang and the father of the family is missing and a couple of the daughters survive thankfully and so they've got to investigate all this mess basically um and the, what the judges said about that was that um, Finn Bell's narrative instincts are right as ever. The focus scope of the story and its relative brevity give it the mood of a locked room mystery with some of the most inventive set pieces you'll ever see. Now, Finn is a very new voice in New Zealand crime writing. He only started publishing back in 2016, but he won our best first novel prize last year with his first book, Dead Lemons. And his second book, Pancake Money, was a finalist for the Naya Marsh Award um, the best novel last year, and now he's on the long list again. So he's certainly hit the ground running wow. with his career yes. with his first three books. So very, uh, very strong narrative voice Finn has. He's um, only available in ebook. We we have our awards are open to ebook authors and indie authors as well as traditional. I see, great. So, Finn um, Bell, he's, right? Yes. Yeah. So the second one, and I'm sorry because there's good ten of these, so this could take well, a little while. Well, the, to go through. The, I mean, this is the, this is the, the the thing about this. You know, this is our our, our Kiwi special, as we've said, yeah, uh, and uh, and therefore, you know, a, a lot of these writers are, are new to me. Um, and and talking to you today, that is that is going to cease to be the case because I will know them and I will look out their books and I I will very much look forward to uh, to reading them. I mean, I have read Paul Cleave, uh, of course, who is absolutely terrific. Uh, so uh, Finn Bell is a new name. So keep them coming, Craig. Fantastic. So the second one is the sound of her voice by Nathan Blackwell. And this is one of our two debut novels that is on the long list for the best crime novel prize. Um, uh, I, I'll just say now we um, have a separate best first novel award. The finalists for that award and the finalists for best um, novel will both be announced in July. The winners, uh, the finalists are all celebrators and the winners um will be announced at an event at the Word Christchurch Festival, which is being held from the 29th of August to the 2nd of September. And right. so we have events there at the festival celebrating the finalists. Um, so we have a long list for our best um, novel category. Uh, we don't have a long list for our best first novel. That just jumps straight from entries to finalists. So, um, but so this is The Sound of Her Voice by Nathan Blackwell. And it's it's kind of a it's a debut. It's focused on Detective Matt Buchanan, who's a detective in Auckland, New Zealand's um, biggest city at the top of the North Island. And uh, there's there's a missing girl case that's kind of haunting him, and some uh, other cases crop up. Um, people go missing. There's some murders. And and rather than being kind of a singular case like you often see with uh, kind of police procedural crime novels or a couple of cases going on at the same time, this actually takes parts over the book goes over months and years and it's kind of the build up of all these cases some of which are interlocking and some of which aren't on um detective buchanan and his psyche and it's kind of a it's, it's kind of a very dark police procedural that's almost like a shakespearean tragedy like the fall of a hero kind of book as well yeah. so it kind of blends it in there's a lot about ptsd and he leaves the force and comes back haunted by cases don't want to give too much away obviously with the plot um, but there's a lot going on, um, and so it's, 
yeah, saying a police procedural doesn't really um, distill it properly, so to speak. It's a very fascinating book. Um, now, with Nathan Blackwell as well, that's a pseudonym because the author is actually a former covert undercover cop in New Zealand. Oh, so for the protection of ongoing cases and, and his own identity, he actually writes under a pseudonym as well. So How, how intriguing. Mystery yeah, within as, mystery. Yeah, and so the judges have said, if this is a debut, then goodness gracious me, raw, emotional, gut-wrenching in places, yet nuanced and well-balanced. This is an amazing piece of work from an underrepresented perspective. Cop stories don't come more authentic than this. And that was a comment from one of our international judges who's judged multiple book awards in, in multiple countries. Wow, so that's a claim indeed. Right, well, yes. good. A another one to, to, to look out for. Number three. Fantastic. And so now we're flipping to the, the other end of the spectrum. So <coughs> where Nathan is a young author with his debut, this is uh, The Lost Taonga by Edmund Bohan. And Taonga is spelt T-A-O-N-G-A. It's a Maori word from New Zealand, and it means treasure. So The Lost Treasure, so to speak, by Edmund Bohan. Now, Edmund is 82 years old. Uh, he's an opera singer, a historian, and a biographer. And back in the 1990s and early 2000s, he wrote five historical mysteries set in kind of 1817s, 1880s New Zealand with an Irish detective, Inspector O'Rourke, who, you know, had gone from Ireland to New Zealand and he was being kind of one of the early policemen and detectives there solving these mysteries. And it was a very well-regarded series, got good reviews. This was all before the Nine Marsh Awards was around, but it, it got good reviews and you can still find the books kind of, you know, in secondhand stores or online, things, those those five Inspector O'Rourke mysteries. So Edmund hasn't written uh, an Inspector O'Rourke mystery for over 10 years, approaching 15 years even. And um, and last year he brought two out after after a kind of a large gap. So and um, and one of them, the Lost Tonga, is is a long stay on this um, for the Nine Marsh Award this year. So we're very very pleased to see Edmund back. It's great to have him back in the in the crime community, along with all the other things he does. So he writes about other things too. And in the Lost Tonga, basically, um, someone steals a Maori treasure and. And Inspector O'Rourke and others are kind of chasing after it, um, both throughout New Zealand and into South America and, and to the UK and Europe as well in the 1880s, trying to track down who's done it, where it's gone, and try and get it back. And, uh, um, and the judges have said historical crime novels usually aren't this fun or snappy, but Bohan definitely avoids all the common traps and delivers a concise story with a heap of finesse, a great sense of time and place, a fascinating hero, and an interesting look at past incidents and sensitivities. Wow. Well, that, that, that's one for me. I love my historical um, uh, murder mysteries. So, uh, well, and, and 82 and two books in one year. That's pretty good yeah. going. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it may have been a situation where one, one may have actually been written a little while ago and, and um, you know, publishers change or publishers go under. And, yes, of course. And so it might have been sitting there and so he kind of brushed one up and wrote another one and brought them both out in the same year kind of thing. So, But we, what, whatever, we are very glad to have Edward back in the fold. He, he came along to some of our early Naya Marsh Award events that supported everyone, even though he hadn't had any books out himself for many years. And so that was lovely. So it's, it's great that um, he's getting recognised now too. Well, he's a, a major f f part of the uh, New Zealand crime writing family. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Now, um, the fourth one is um, Marlborough Man by Alan Carter. And Alan is, Alan is an interesting guy. He's actually um, he's from Sunderland originally. And so from the north of England. Right. And then he moved to Australia many, many years ago. And he, he started writing a, a series set in Western Australia. He lived in Perth, a Kato Kwong series starring an Asian-Australian detective in Western Australia. And he won the Ned Kelly Award, which is the Australian Crime Writing Prize. Uh, he won their best first novel category uh, several years ago for the first book in that series. Um, in the last two or three years, he's actually moved to New Zealand, a um, lovely place to live. So he's now a New Zealand resident and lives in New Zealand uh, in kind of a hobby farm in, Mul in the Marlborough Sounds, which is a very beautiful scenic area in the top of the South Island of New Zealand. <coughs> and Excuse me, sorry. And he, um, so his fourth novel is actually set in New Zealand and stars, interestingly enough, a, um, a British police officer who's basically in witness protection in New Zealand because of some gang violence things that have gone on that he was involved uh, in. Ah, uh, that's an interesting England. conceit, yes. And so there's uh, some missing kids, uh, some murders in Marlborough, and also this looming threat of the gang 
the British gang guys, um, some in prison, some are not, hunting him down in New Zealand under his new identity. And so that's Marlborough Man by Alan Carter. And the judges have called it a terrific full-throated crime thriller that puts the freshest of spins on the cop with the past trope. Carter is a first-class wordsmith. And he yanks his Sunderland exile Nick back from the brink of anti-heroism by endowing him with self-awareness and humility. Alan's a really good author. I, I really enjoyed his Carter Kwong series a couple of years ago when I was reading it. And I've met Alan at Crime Fest in, in recent years. He just appeared at, at Newcastle Noir, actually. Oh, was he up there? I see. Oh, right. Sounds excellent. What, what's number five, Craig? Oh, well, number five. So this is a name that you have no Bob. So there's a killer harvest by Paul Cleave. Oh, yes, which is, yes, yes, which yes. Which is Paul's 10th and latest novel. Now, um, Paul has quite the pedigree with the knives. He's a multiple he time. Does, fi- yes. He's a multiple time finalist. He's won it three times. He's the only author to have won it more than once. And he's also won French crime writing prizes, being shortlisted for the Edgar and Barry Awards in the United States and everything else. And basically, um, he's a must read author if you like the darker end of the crime spectrum. Yes, I agree, and, absolutely. And he's um, the cool thing for British for your British listeners is that up until recently, up until a couple of years ago, he was actually a little hard to find in the UK, just the vagaries of the publishing world. He was a bestseller in France, a bestseller in Germany, award nominated in the US and available there. And I think he was published in about 20-something countries and languages. Um, But just the way publishing sometimes works internationally, he, he wasn't readily available in the UK, which was really frustrating. And how did that come about? We, we, you, did you help in that particular area by by sort of? Uh, oh sort no, of... no 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 no! He, um, he it was nothing to do with me other than uh, no, nothing to do with me Shout at all. Shout outs I mean, I... and uh, and uh, yeah and praise. Um, yeah. But uh, no, he got picked up recently by um, Hodder in the UK, which was great, and uh, they sorted things out. And so they brought out his book Trust No One last year, which won our Crime Fiction Award, uh, the Nine Marshall Award, the year before. And um, so that was great. And then they're bringing out his backlist now. And, and I think A Killer Harvest, this this book that's long listed, should be coming out shortly if it's not out already as well in the UK, which is great. And Paul's gone a little bit inventive in this one. It was um, He has, for the first time, a teenage hero rather than an adult um, private eye or cop or serial killer or um, person investigating a crime. And um, basically there's a, teen- uh, there's a blind teenager called Joshua who um, hasn't had his sight for his whole life. And he's got, um, unfortunately, his father is a police officer who gets killed in the line of duty. And uh, Joshua gets a retina and eye transplant to help him with his sight. Um, so he gets his father's eyes, or that's the plan, at least. Um, but then he starts having visions, like flashbacks, kind of, of things that his father's seen. Um, some of which violent, some of which confused Joshua. And at the same time, there's people hunting Joshua down because of the incident where his father got killed in the line of duty and things like that. So it's quite a an interesting, twisty take on crime fiction. Almost, I would say it's almost crime fiction. If this was a literary novel, you would call it magic realism, mm, where yes. it's, it's 95% authentic and grounded in the real world with one thing that makes it a little bit out there kind mm. of thing. Um, so, yeah, if this was a literary award and literary thing, we'd be going, oh, this is amazing magic realism. But, of course, it's crime fiction, so people don't actually term it that way. But, no, it's a very inventive um, literary in a sense while still being just a really good, like, full-throttle crime thriller. And the judges have said, uh, Cleve becomes more inventive and imaginative, aiming for a higher degree of difficulty with each novel. The narrative dexterity and fluidity of a killer harvest is impressive. It's effect spellbinding. Probably Cleve's most original work yet, with a refreshing air of intrepidity and well-earned confidence, even brashness. Oh, that sounds awesome. like a, a wonderful twist on crime, throwing a, a little bit of uh, almost sci-fi in there. Yes, I mean, yeah, what, yes. What, what heading, is, heading towards that. What is a medical so, condition where people get? That, that, I mean, that actually exists, doesn't it? Where a, a sort of uh, I forget what it's called now. Uh, where people pick up visions from, um, uh, uh, I mean, I've, 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 I've completely forgot what it's called, but there is a medical term where uh, that, that deals with that, and I will uh, rush off and find it <laughs> on Wikipedia. No, yeah, uh, there, there is. I know the term. I, I'm blanking to it myself at the time, but it's kind of like 
the kind of the ghost thing from organ donation. Yeah, and, that's and, that's that's what it is. Yes, like you feel a limb or you you remember yeah. someone else's memory. You can get a phantom uh, itch, can't you? Yeah. After you've had a, yeah. an amputation, you can feel the itch oh, foot that you've no longer got. That's another another very interesting sort of so, similar thing. So Paul's kind of brought that into crime fiction. You know, ramped it up times a hundred. You know, for the story yeah, and things good. like that. Yes. Mm. And um, no, it's a very fascinating book, and it'll be interesting to see how he fares this year um, because it's a very strong long list. But he's um, he's done very well on the knives in the past, and definitely an author worth. And it's great, out. great to know he's so available, uh, as you say, through through Hodder um, uh, in in the UK as well now. Mm-hmm. So that, that's true. yes, and I understand um, that Paul will be over here for festivals later in the year as well. I think some of those announcements are coming out soon, so I perhaps shouldn't specify which festivals. Right, but, okay. But he will be, um, UK readers will have a chance to, to meet Paul in person and, and get him some books as well. S- yeah. Smashing Wilbur. Over here in the middle latter part of um, of the year kind of thing. So. Right. On to the, uh, the women authors then. Yes, yes, so we've got the five guys. Now, I apologise if I'm talking too much about each book, guys. No, but you're I, not at all because... I mean, they they all it, deserve time. They all do. I mean, this is an important uh, a long list for, you know, a very important award. This is, you know, uh, Dame Nao Marsh Awards are, 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 you know, are, are, are important. And, again, you know, this is, this is news to many, certainly UK uh, readers uh, uh, and, uh, and many other readers throughout the world. So uh, take as long as you like, Craig. Oh, brilliant. I appreciate it, guys. So so the next one is an author that UK readers may be more familiar with, but not necessarily for crime, at least not in the last 15 years. This is another author who's incredibly good across genres and has written great crime fiction in the past, but has taken a wee break or hiatus from crime, but we are now welcoming back with open arms. And I think from what you've told me, Bob, maybe... um quite appropriate given uh, other things you're covering in this podcast as well. Someone we're speaking to later in the show, actually, I believe you're about to announce. Yeah, so I just just talked to her um, recently, congratulating her, so um, hopefully she may even uh, be able to talk to you about that as well. And um, so The Hidden Room by Stella Duffy. And it's Stella's first crime novel in more than a decade. Um, People more recently will know her for her historic and literary Novels like Theodora or London Lies Beneath, great books, really worth reading. Even if you're a crime fan, you know, go read these too. They're great. Um, she just she's just a great storyteller overall, and obviously a great stage storyteller with theatre and, and improv and things like that as well. And and Fun Palace is just a powerhouse of awesomeness, really. Stella is, um, but she also <laughs> she's also. Um, yeah, a really, really good crime writer. And she actually won two, I believe, CWA daggers for short story crime writing back in the kind of uh, late 90s, early 2000s kind of area. Um, and um, so, and she was kind of a, a mistress of what they called tart noir back then. So the, some of the female crime writers coming to the fore with kind of edgier crime fiction and pushing the boundaries. And, and Stella was part of that with her, her Saz Martin series, um, having a lesbian private eye um, back at a, back at a time when, um, you know, now we might think, oh, that's, you know, that's normal. But actually back only 15, 20, 25 years ago, that was still quite stark for a lot of people and a lot of readers in the, in the literary and current communities. And the likes of uh, Stella and Val McDermott and Rose Beecham and others kind of, you know, kind of driving some of those things, which was now we look back on, we don't realize how groundbreaking they were back then, so to speak. So, but so it's, it's brilliant to have Stella back. And The Hidden Room is a really fascinating standalone psychological thriller. Um, basically, it, it has a couple, Laurie and Martha, who have um, three kids and a home in the, in the British countryside. And they have, you know, all the normal domestic pressures and struggles in life. And uh, Laurie's an architect, and but she grew up in a cult in the in the desert in the in the United States as a as a teenager and stuff like that and escaped and her past kind of haunts her a little and starts kind of coming back and maybe someone from her past life might be stalking her or trying to insert themselves into her life so it's a creepy psychological domestic thriller though I, I don't necessarily like using that term because it's not at all like um you know the kind of boom in domestic noir that we're seeing it's quite stella gives it quite a different twist so i don't just want to lump her in with all the 
or the girl, the girl who books, you know, kind of things yeah. that come, kind of, or the woman who, or the wife who, or the husband who, kind of books yes. and stuff. Girl, Many of which are good, girl in the desert, it's <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah, and and no, this is an outstanding piece of psychological thriller writing. And the judges have called it unsettling and un- unusual, a fascinating character study of a woman grappling with the present day effect of past trauma. Duffy presents a difficult subject with subtlety and grace, devastating and thought provoking. Mm, well, I, I know all about unsettling and unusual sitting next to this man here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the great Stella Duffy. I mean, that's fantastic. So she kickstarts uh, the first of, of five. Uh, uh, so uh, who is number six on the long list? Well, number six seven. Is... Oh, is it number seven? Yeah. yeah oh, of course it is, yes, number yes, seven. Yes, see, yes of course. We're hopeless at maths. Um, yes. uh, but, uh, so, so the next author... Um, we're going alphabetically, obviously, is um, The Only Secret Left to Keep by Catherine Hayton. And, and Catherine's, a, I guess you'd call it an indie author, um, self-published and published through Amazon. She's won some Amazon stuff that got, you know, online and ebook and print publishing with Amazon and won some kind of uh, indie awards and, and things over the years. And uh, this is called The Only Secret Left to Keep. It's the third book in her Detective Nairi Blake's series. She's also written some um, other, other books that have... Uh, kind of had been really well reviewed in the past she's quite prolific um she's been writing for a few years and she's got kind of 10 plus books out there now and this is the the third in her nairi blake series and um detective nairi blake who's a maori detective in the south island of new zealand is uh kind of investigating a cold case uh when a skeleton of a murder victim is discovered and the crime ties back to the 1981 springbok tour in new zealand And, and for your for your um, listeners who aren't aware, this is quite a seminal moment in New Zealand history. The Springbok Tour was when the South African rugby team um, came to play rugby in New Zealand in 1981 at a time when almost everywhere in the world had an, a, a ban on sports with South Africa because of apartheid. But New Zealand being such a big rugby country and South Africa being such a big rugby country, we kind of continued rugby links at a time when Olympics and everywhere else was banning South Africa. So it was quite controversial on a world stage back then and quite controversial within New Zealand, almost a civil war, not 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 in a, that kind of extent. I don't want to overplay it. But there were violent protests, um, you know, flower bombs dropped from planes on the rugby field, people, you know, attacks threatened, military police out with batons, which was very unusual for New Zealand, which is... A little bit like Scandinavia is seen as quite a peaceful place with great scenery and, and quite socially just, you know, first country to give women the vote and all sorts of other things like that. Um, but this was quite a stark moment from our contemporary history. And so um, so this book is kind of set, obviously, against that as well as modern times. And um, and the victim is discovered to be a young African-American man. And and Nairi um, has kind of got to investigate that, and everyone who's obviously been hiding everything in the years since as well. And um, the judges have said, I like Hayton's series, his style, and her main character's frankness and intelligence. Detective Nairi Blakes has a real resonant and irresistible voice, an excellent cast, and a strong story. And uh, Catherine was actually longlisted last year for the first in that series. She had two books out last year from the series. And um, so what I'll say is she's uh, long-listed back-to-back, which is an impressive achievement. That's, so. that's pretty good going, isn't it? Well, I mean, so that's absolutely great, and 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 uh, and a leading indie writer, so uh, to boot. So um, and that's also great, I think, about these awards: the fact that it is open to everyone, regardless of the yes. method of publishing. There are so many awards that are only open to traditionally published authors. So some that are kind of indie only to to fight back against that. But um, obviously, the Nia Marsh Awards are fully inclusive for everyone which is which is great yeah we just we want to find and celebrate the best new zealand crime writing and the best new zealand crime stories um whether the authors are new zealanders overseas or um you know foreign born people who now live in new zealand or or whoever you know new zealand authors new zealand crime stories let's celebrate the best of them and um regardless of how they're published um obviously you know you know, we get a lot of indie entries and, and of varying qualities, but there's a lot of great indie stuff out there as well. So we're we're really glad to highlight that. So, well, right. and, and you do. So number number, I'm going to get this right now, Craig. Number eight. <laughs> number eight. <laughs> so number eight is another of as the second of our debut authors, and it's called Baby by Annalise Jochems. 
And Annalise is an interesting young author. She's in her very, very early 20s. Um, really fresh new voice in, in New Zealand writing. And she was recently, last week, she was a finalist for the Ockham New Zealand Book Awards, the Acorn Foundation Fiction Prize, which is kind of probably the, for your British r- r- listeners is kind of our equivalent to the the Booker Prize and that it's more of a literary award or a general fiction award. And so she's um, kind of come through that channel and seen as a more literary or general fiction author. But this is a, a kind of a psychological thriller, so um, kind of qualified for our awards too. So it's, um, so she was shortlisted for that, uh, that kind of Best New Zealand Novel um, Prize at the Ockham's. And, and now she's long listed for our crime writing, well, our crime mystery thriller writing prize as well. And it's a, so in this book, there's a 21 year old kind of bored millennial woman kind of desperate and yearning. And, and she strikes up a relationship with her fitness instructor and kind of abandons her life. And her fitness instructor abandons her husband and they go live on, on a boat off the Bay of Islands in New Zealand, which is a very scenic area in the north of the North Island. Um, and there's always there's this kind of creeping sense of unease of like what happened to the girls uh, to the fitness instructor's husband are uh, people chasing them there's this looming threat kind of all around them of violence that may have happened off page or violence that may be about to happen and things could explode and it's it's a kind of it's a really intriguing literary psychological thriller kind of um, so. With an unusual name, it's not a it's not a typical uh, crime fiction uh, title, is it? Uh, no, well, and you would love the cover too. It's it's a bright pink cover with the word baby on it, with a <laughs> j- with a jammed sandwich, so white bread and jam seeping out of it, and that's yeah. the cover. I'm looking and at it now. What's like, uh, not to like? <laughs> it, I'm looking at it now. It's very much not a crime cover. No, I won't no, see it. I think, no, I think the it cover now, might have been shortlisted for some cover art awards in Australia and New Zealand as well. Um, and the judges have said an interesting take on profoundly unlikable characters. This is disconcerting reading, cleverly constructed with a low key style that reflects its characters very well. Unusual concept, and uh, it's also been called a sunburnt psychological thriller because in the heat of the summery part of New Zealand and things like that. So, very interesting book. Um, I, I I'm not a voting judge for these awards, but I I because I founded them and was a judge in the early years and now I kind of supervise the judges and help them along but I try and read all the books myself just to keep up with what's going on and I was very intrigued by this one I I when I reviewed it um I called it a marmite book um which I'm not sure it's a phrase you guys use over here in, in Britain uh, it um, definitely is, it is yes yes, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You either so like it or you don't. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a love or a hate kind of book because it's written in a very interesting style, um, stylistically. It's obviously where it's got some nods from the literary community and the general fiction awards as well. And it's kind of a slow burn psychological thriller where a lot happens off screen and you can't trust any of the characters and they're all quite unlikable, but you're kind of drawn in anyway. And I found it. I found it like bewildering and brilliant, but other people may just hate the guts of it, you know, kind of thing. So I'll be very curious to see how how it comes through. But obviously, our judges have really enjoyed it to put it on the long list from a record record number of entries. So mm. bewildering and brilliant sounds good. Yeah. To me. We'll stick with that endorsement. I think that's <laughs> <laughs> so, n- number nine. And so number nine is um, Tess by Kirsten McDougall, and. Um, not to say it's similar to Baby, but they're actually from the same publisher, which is a more literary publisher in New Zealand. And Tess was long, and Tess was long listed for the the Ockham Book Prize as well. So again, it's a it's not a it's not a typical detective fiction or crime novel, um, and but it's a really great book. And it's a I think it's Kirsten's second novel. And basically, there's a there's a girl on the run around, and this happens around kind of the turn of the millennium in New Zealand, so the late 1990s, early 2000s. And there's a girl on the run and she's picked up on the side of the road by like a lonely middle-aged father who takes her to his house with his um, family and tries to like put her up because she may or may not be in danger. She may or may not be in danger from him. He may or may not be in danger from her. And then all sorts of things start happening. And it's kind of a a gothic suspense novel. Um, When I read it, I, I kind of compare it, not saying it's exactly the same, but it's kind of nodding towards a book like Rebecca by Du Maurier, where it's that kind of isolated rural uh, 
you don't know what dark deeds have happened in the past or what dark violence may be kind of growing and scratching at you from just outside what you can see. And is it all going to explode on the page or what's going on? And it's just deliciously written. Um, but sorry, that's my personal opinion. But for the judges, they've called it a real chiller. This short novel hits a lot of high notes, and McDougal's prose is superb. Her exploration of violence is artful. It's mostly seen in threat and flashback, psychological suspense that's claustrophobic, different, and very, very clever. Wow, that sounds really intriguing. Gosh. Yes, it's a good book. And and it's probably just a moment for me to pause, sorry, to, to point out that um, because our, our awards were traditionally called the Naya Marsh Award for Best Crime Novel, um, but they were always for crime, mystery, thriller, and suspense novels. We obviously couldn't put all that on the title of the award when no. we started. <laughs> and, and, and we also, um, when we began, we modelled our award, some of it because New Zealand, we know we had a smaller literary base in a smaller country far away. We modelled it more on like the, the Hammett Prize in North America, which is for literary excellence in crime writing. So we were never a, a solely detective fiction award or a solely, you know, detective fit spy and and Private Eye Award. We've always taken a very broad view of, of crime fiction. You know, for us, some of Shakespeare is crime fiction. For us, Dostoevsky is crime fiction. A little bit of Dickens is crime You know, we're taking that broader look at crime and thriller and suspense. Oh, that's great. And, and, um, and that's, that's the way it should be. I mean, you know, the, 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 the overall umbrella of crime writing and the many other g genres and styles that, that uh, sit under that umbrella, you know, it should be represented. And you're obviously doing that superbly well. So we're into the number ten now. My God, I can't, yes. are we in number ten? Gee, my goodness me! Uh, uh, so um, yeah, so as of this year, our award's actually called the Naya Marsh Award for Best Novel. We just uh, take it but they sometimes the call the Nios. Yeah, we just call them the Nios. Everyone yeah, calls them the Nios. I like now. that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with, so. with, with the greatest respect and deference to. Uh, no, no, I like Nios. it too. It's like the Agatha, <laughs> the Edgar Allan Poe Awards, and the you know the Agatha Christie Awards or the Agathas, and you know, so it's exactly what we were hoping to get to. And the you know, once people knew more about it over the years, you know, so um, and our final long listy, um, last but not least, it's "See You in September" by Charity Norman. Um, Charity is an interesting author. She was actually born in Uganda. Um, to British parents who were missionaries and grew up in Yorkshire and Birmingham and now lives in New Zealand in the Hawke's Bay, which is a lovely sunny coastal area with apple orchards on the on the east coast of the North Island. And um, this is uh, she's written a couple of novels in the past and, and kind of general fiction, women's fiction, contemporary psychological thriller kind of stuff. And, um, and this one, See You in September, involves... Uh, I'm not sure if you'd say tourist necessarily, but someone travels to New Zealand um, for a best friend's wedding, decides to travel around um, and explore and says goodbye to her parents. And, uh, but she's gone through a relationship breakup and some other things. And then basically she vanishes and um, she kind of gets, she, but she vanishes not in a violent missing way, but in a, she joins a rural cult in New Zealand way kind of thing. And, and so she becomes more and more involved in this cult and her parents are, and Brennan and stuff are getting frantic, obviously, to try and bring her home because they're worried that this cult might be one of those ones that'll go all Jim Jones, let's drink the, the Powerade or let's drink the Kool-Aid. That was it, let's drink the Kool-Aid, you know? And so it's kind of a, it's an interesting take on the kind of a psychological thriller slash cult kind of um, domestic, noir, you know, rural kind of mystery kind of all going on in a, in a bit of a mix. And the judges have said of it a character driven drama that's an all too believable exploration of cults. Norman's clearly done her homework. The depiction of how vulnerable people can succumb to the lure of ideology, charisma and the promise of utopia is disturbing. Wow. So the um the full long list there for the Nio Marsh Award for Best Novel, I'll just run through them there. The Eastern Make Believers by Finn Bell, The Sound of Her Voice by Nathan Blackwell, The Lost to Anger by Edmund Bohan. Marlborough Man by Alan Carter, A Killer Harvest by Paul Cleave, The Hidden Room by Stella Duffy, The Only Secret Left to Keep by Catherine Hayton, Baby by Annalise Jokims, Tess by Kirsten McDougall, and See You in September by Charity Norman. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. See, we could, have, we could have just got you reading that out, out of rather well, than me. All of that what? background information is fantastic. But uh, it, what what a what a wealth of uh, of writing talent and storytellers yes. uh, uh, you have. Uh, that's a long list. Now that's going to be uh, the the short list is out when in July is that right? 
Yeah, we um we don't have an exact date because obviously things depend on judging yeah. and various other things because we have an international judging panel. Um, we're a little bit different to other awards how we set up. We actually have a seven-judge panel that's spread around the world. Right. Uh, right. So we don't obviously have lunch meetings to discuss them no. or things like that. <laughs> yeah, it's all, uh, we're, we're taking advantage of, um, of, kind of internet and other communications, phone and email and everything else. And uh, yeah, we're very fortunate. When we when we began back in 2010, one of the things that I wanted to do was celebrate New Zealand crime writing and say it's deserving of attention, it's deserving of readership, it's deserving of more people looking at it. And we have these great authors. Um, let's celebrate them. And so right from the start, when we started the prize, you know, no sponsors, nothing involved or anything like that. One of the things I wanted to do was just get the very best judges we possibly could, because that would give the awards some gravitas, some of um, some you know some sense of being really good and so right from the beginning we've already always had international judges involved as well as new some of new zealanders craig it's been you know it's lovely talking to you as ever your enthusiasm and, and, the, and the work you've done with the, the naos who let's face it after what you've said are bang on trend um and we're, we've been very excited to actually listen to the uh, to the the long list uh, and the incredible uh, a array of, of fine crime writers that New Zealand is is producing uh, in all sorts of areas of the crime fiction uh, genre um, and it's just been great talking to you I tell you the one thing I would like to say I noticed on the list that uh, a couple of years ago you had a, uh, someone nominated for uh, 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 the award uh, Barbara Ewing you yes, Barbara, Barbara Ewing. She was in my, yeah, the, the my, my very first job as an actor, pretty much, at the Derby Playhouse in about 1980. We were doing Joe Orton's Loot, and it's a very difficult play, but great fun. And I had two lines, and all I had to do was walk on at the beginning of the first, the second half of the play and put some handcuffs on the main character, who's an inspector. And half a page later, I had to unlock them and take them off, and then I went off stage. Well, one night I came on and I put the handcuffs on, and half a page later, when I was supposed to take them off, I couldn't find the key. <laughs> and so I stayed on stage for the rest of the play. Unfortunately, this was a press night, and two days later there was a review in the local paper which said how brilliantly inspiring Joe Orton's work is, and especially that wonderful comic device of keeping the policeman on stage all the way through the second half because he couldn't get the handcuffs <laughs> off. So uh, <laughs> so Barbara was with me at, at that, and uh, I remember she was writing then, and she's obviously gone on to, to great acclaim with, with, with many other books since. So that's my sort of little link to the Naos. But um, listen, thank you very much. Can we have another chat uh, when the uh, the winner is announced? Absolutely, yes. The winner will be announced, as I say, um, I'm not sure exactly which day of the festival they're doing the event, uh, but it, the festival's from the 29th of August to the 2nd of September. There'll be um, a lot of different books, events, a lot of different genres covered, including crime, but also some other really cool stuff. Rachel King and her team at Word Christchurch do an amazing job putting that festival together. Um, Denise Miner, actually, the McElvaney oh, Prize yes. winner last year, is going to be down there for it, and there might Fantastic. be some other... Fantastic. Some other international crime writers, as well as some New Zealand crime writers, and one of the events there will be will be uh, announced, uh, celebrating the finalists and announcing the winners of both best best novel and best first novel. So yeah, absolutely happy to chat to you about that. I might even be able to um, get you on the phone with the with the winner or two if you like. Well, but... That would be quite a coup. We'd absolutely love that. And I tell you, I for one could quite happily spend the next few months in New Zealand reading every one of those books. Um, thank you for taking us through so in such detail and so vividly uh, explaining uh, the, the state of, the healthy state of uh, Kiwi crime writing now. And thank you for being such a, a fantastic enthusiast and, and professional uh, uh, with your crime watch. Anyone who wants to know what's going on can actually get onto your blog site and follow your worldwide reviews of, of, of crime fiction, but they'll also find out much more about the Naos, Naos and, uh, and Craig Sisterson. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Well, it's always a very exciting time for, for writers when long lists and short lists and winners and things are announced, especially if you're on the list. I, I've never been on one myself, but I can imagine it's um, that those people are going to be very excited right now. Well, yes, I mean, it's an extraordinary thing because it, it, you know, it helps, uh, uh, obviously, well-established, best-selling authors 
as well as as, as new writers, as uh, as Craig pointed out so eloquently there. Uh, and it's an extraordinary list, um, and lovely to hear his passion uh, and his dedication to actually bringing uh, Kiwi crime writing, thriller writing, uh, to world attention. And good that he also told us quite a bit about each book as well. So sort of whetted the uh, the audience's appetites. So, oh, every, um, every time you get a new description, I went, I've got to read that. Oh, yeah, I've got to read that. I've got to read that. So hopefully our listeners will too and go out and buy the lot and spend spend a, spend the next six months in, in, in New Zealand <laughs> in your imagination. Well, you can get ninety uh, percent off of one of those books at Kobo dot com. If you're not already a customer, head over to Kobo dot com, choose one of those books, and enter the promo code Crime at the checkout, and they'll give you ninety percent off, which is Fantastic. Um, 90%. That's yeah. very, a very generous first offer. It is. Well, the folk at Kobo are very generous, and that is exclusive to Partners in Crime listeners as well. That's not available oh, anywhere else. What do you mean everyone else gets 85? Get <laughs> no, <laughs> everyone else gets 95. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you want to get in contact with the show, if you've got anything to tell us, if you want to uh, suggest a guest or uh, a topic of conversation, we do read all the emails, take all your suggestions very seriously. And in fact, we've uh, we've moulded a number of episodes around listener suggestions. We have no, we do actually listen to to, to what you say. If if we can do anything, uh, uh, um, your suggestions, we, we we set about doing it. So thank you very much. Uh, we we value your contribution immensely. So so. Keep the emails coming uh, and uh, keep the dialogue up. Yes, yeah, so you can email hello at partnersincrime.online. Our website is partnersincrime.online. We're on Twitter at Crime Fic Podcast and we're on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash partnersincrime podcast. All right, I think we should um, get on with uh, our second special guest. Yes. So I do like this shows where we have two special guests. Yes, I but do. Apart too. from when it comes to editing them. Especially yeah. when they're as special as these special guests are. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Stella Duffy is a writer and theatre maker who was born in London and raised in New Zealand and now lives back here in the UK. With over 60 novels, short stories and plays to her name, she's one of the country's most prolific writers and in 2016 was awarded an OBE for her services to the arts. Recently, she's completed one of Nio Marsh's unfinished and almost forgotten works, Money in the Morgue, which she's here today to tell us all about. Hello, Stella. Hello. Um, now, Money in the Morgue, tell us a little bit about how that came about. I understand it was a novel that um, Niall Marsh started writing, but then abandoned. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's interesting is people have assumed that because she hadn't finished it, that she was writing it when she died. But that's not the case. She was writing it during the war. We don't know exactly when, um, but we know that she finished. There was sort of almost four chapters, and they're very short. They're very short compared to her normal introduction chapters. So I don't think, I really don't think she got any further than um, a first draft. And a couple of pages of notes, none of which were particularly um, useful in terms of who done it, why done it, or what done it. So none, none of that was in her notes. There was just um, these three and a half, it ended up being about three and a half chapters. Um, and they are what is now the beginning of the book. Um, and then some pages of notes, but they really weren't very in-depth at all. Not least, I mean, in the first three and a half chapters, she didn't even have Alan in the book. So we hadn't got to seeing what he was going to do or why he was there. Um, and uh, Hub Collins had had this material for quite some time. I think about 20 years, David Braun said when he approached me about doing it. Um, and then another piece of material, but again, not, you know, it wasn't like, here's the entire narrative I'm looking for you, turned up. And at which point they thought, well, they'd contact me um, because I've written crime novels and literary fiction. And um, yes, Noah Marsh is one of the queens of crime, but she's also a very good literary writer. And I think people do miss that if they're only concentrating on plot, which, dare I say it, I don't think she's as good as Christie, but if you're looking for narrative, if you're looking for um, story content, if you're looking for literary and for character and setting, I think she's a winner. So anyway, they came to me, um, and I have to say, having grown up in New Zealand, born in London, she loved London, she loved New Zealand, she was a theatre director, I'm a theatre maker, um, I would have been pretty grumpy if they'd have asked anybody else, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and as far as I know, it's not, I don't know that they did ask anyone else when they turned them down, but um, when they did ask me, I 
I, you know, it's not my genre. I mean, golden age crime fiction is really not my thing. Um, not that I don't like it to read, but I, I'm not a puzzle writer. I'm, I'm just not that kind of a writer. So it was daunting and absolutely terrifying to be asked. But at the same time, it was just too juicy an offer to turn down. <laughs> I can't say no to that, can you? No, no absolutely. <laughs> I mean, when you were completing the novel, did you come across any reason that, that you spotted why Naya Marsh might have abandoned the book? Did you come at, you know, was there a point where you thought, ah, yeah, that, that, that's why she shelved this one? <laughs> um, not really, although, I mean, it's the way I've ended up writing it, it's very much a, a locked room mystery. Um, that's not in the first three inch and a half chapters that she wrote, although I think there are some clues. You know, there's a rickety bridge and a very fast flowing river, and um, it's midsummer, which means that there could well be sudden floods and storms. Um, so it became a lot of mystery very quickly. When I was in New Zealand last year for a few book festivals and some museums work, um, I went to the Nyam Marsh House and spoke with the people from the Nyam Marsh House Trust. And there's varying views. Some people think that, it's, that she stopped writing it because the war ended and she didn't want to write something set in the war anymore. She'd already um, had colour scheme and died in the wool and perhaps she didn't want to you know, have another war story. Other people think it was because she'd been in New Zealand the whole time during the war and she really did have a passion for, for Britain, but London in particular, and wanted to get back. And then other people think that perhaps she had had a relationship with somebody during the war when she was an ambulance driver um, in New Zealand and that one of the characters might have been the person she had a relationship with and so she didn't want to give that away. Mm. Um, or a combination you know, of all three, perhaps. Oh, could well be. And, you know, she's famously private about her private life. So um, several people said to me, oh, it must be that. I'm like, well, yeah, maybe, but... She didn't want to talk about it in her lifetime, so who are we to speculate? No, absolutely right. I mean, were you a? I mean, you mentioned kind of reading golden age fiction. Were you a, a bit of a fan of Naya Marsh beforehand? Did you kind of read her works? You know, what, what... Um, I had read her work because I grew up in New Zealand, and um, although in New Zealand, she, you know, for, certainly when I was growing up, she was much more successful and much more famous for her theatre work. Right. Um, yeah. Um, how can I say this politely? I can't. New Zealand, it's not so bad. It's not so bad now, okay? But when I was growing up in New Zealand in the 70s and 80s, New Zealand um, right readers were quite snobby about that. I mean, you know, we all suffer from genre snobbery anyway around genre fiction and crime writing in particular. I've written historical novels. That has the same. Um, as far as I'm concerned, literary fiction is just another genre, you know. But, um, but in New Zealand, when I was a kid, the big bookshops would have a big shelf called fiction and then another shelf called literature. Wow. By, yeah, I know. By literature, they meant no genre fiction, um, you know, only literary fiction. And it was, and, and so I, I mean, they didn't mean classics. They actually meant this is literature and that's just fiction. Wow. So actually, she had quite a hard time for her writing in New Zealand, though she was massively respected as a director. Which meant that by the time I was growing up, I read her because I was just desperate to read any work by women because there's, there was so little. But I was particularly in my teens looking for work with, with women heroes. And she didn't have many of those. I mean, Troy is just to, I think you can absolutely argue that Troy is a hero, but I think we can tell that Marsh is very much in love with Alan herself and he's always her, her big lead. Um, so, I mean, I read uh, Christie's Marple stories rather than reading Naya Marsh when, when I was a kid because I just wanted to read about a woman and how a woman thought and what a woman did. And we're much better now. There's so much more work by women and with women leads. But, you know, it's not that – well, I'm 55. Maybe it is that long ago. But it doesn't feel that long ago to me. But there were so few stories with women leads, and, and I really miss that. So I knew about her work. I'd read her work. Um, I probably suffered from the same snobbery that um, my my um, friends and, and family did. We didn't take her writing seriously. Um, she was a crime writer writing, particularly in the 80s. New Zealand was very, very political. You know, it was really strong stuff happening around um, Māori tanga, Māori culture, around the resurgence of the Māori language. And when you look at something like Photo Finish, where she really could have addressed current issues and they're just not there at all, I think that's a real shame. So so I just wasn't in the right place to be reading and valuing her then. Um, what was great about coming back to, to writing Money in the Morgue was that I had an opportunity to really revise um, how I perceived her work and see not only what 
you know, what a great job she'd done as a golden age fiction writer, but how well, certainly in, in the first three New Zealand novels, she represented the nation. Mm. I, mean, I mean, in finishing that book and uh, well, and, and, and writing it mostly, you um, you must have had to have kind of encapsulated and included the, the spirit of Naya Marsh's writing as as you saw it. I mean, what what for you is that that spirit and that essence of um, Naya Marsh? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think I think her. You know, we often talk about. You guys will have done this with with the blog. You know, um, with podcasts. Sorry. Um, so many crime writers talk about setting as being really enormous for them and that in and people often i mean i think it's a bit of a lazy cliche but i i don't i understand why people often talk about place being being a character in crime fiction and for naya marsh i think place is so enormous and you know so there's the the, the new zealand novels um color scheme died in the wall vintage murder and photo finish and in all of them even photo finish which i i do think is you know it's a late novel she's clearly tired it's not as certainly not as good as her other three new zealand novels but the place and the land and the strength of that land is so clear and so strong and it's and and i think that's also to do with her having lived in london for you know so much of the time i think she's writing both with the view of a new zealander writing about new zealand but a new zealander maybe looking at it from an outside perspective, which, of course, I have now, having lived in London for 30 years myself. And I was born here, but I spent, you know, I was in New Zealand from the age of five to 23, so that's very New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so writing about the land for me was fantastic because it, there's something about... I mean, she mentions... She uses the word primordial in every one of her New Zealand books at least once, and I managed to use it only once. Um, <laughs> There's, there's something about that land that is so that she's so passionate about, and I think you know most most New Zealanders are passionate about their land. In in Maori tongue and Maori culture, you know the land is a real entity. It's it's a living, breathing entity, as is the sea. And for those of us who take that seriously, that's really important. So so this land and this setting, um, and I think you see that in her her um, British set fiction as well, but it's particularly strong in New Zealand. I think she's really good with the cast of characters, and I think that is very clearly because of her theatre work. Um, you know, she was a very successful director of, of Shakespeare in particular, which is invariably large cast. Um, she worked a lot with youth theatres and student theatres, so she's really, you know, she's of her time, but she's awfully good with young people. You know, there, there's always a range of ages in her casts, and I think that's that's a really good lesson to writers. I think. Um, particularly new writers. I don't I don't teach very often, but I, I do teach an, an Arvon course maybe um, once every couple of years. And I say to people, don't just write about your own age. You know, lots of people start writing in, I guess, 20s or 30s, and they're only writing about characters their own age, but that's not the real world. The real world has characters of all ages. And um, Naomi Marsh is very good at having characters of all ages, and I, and I really do um, assume that's to do with her, her theatre work and particularly her Shakespeare work. She's great with bit parts. You know, <laughs> she really is. You know, other people may concentrate on their leads, and of course we do. I mean, it, it, you know, our leads are what carries the narrative. Our leads are what help people turn the page. But a really good bit part can be so enjoyable for the reader. It can give them a really lovely, particularly with, with crime fiction, a really lovely break from the main strong thrust of, of, of the story. It takes us out of, you know, what we're following avidly and gives us a little bit of a rest, which I, which I think really gives us a reason to go back into the story. Yeah. And she's, she's fantastic at that. As I said, you know, of 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 those those four queens of crime, I really I don't think she's as hot on plotting as as Christie, but then I don't think many people are as hot on plotting as Christie. <laughs> no. um, and I don't think that's a problem. I think that you know every writer has something in particular they bring to to their fiction that people love them for, and I and I think character is absolutely one of one of Marsha's huge strengths, which of course made it bloody terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Right, the rest of the book. Did she um, ever, like know, Dame Agatha, uh, Agatha uh, adapt her, her her books to the stage? Uh, um, yeah, oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 one one of your listeners who knows much better than me will know this. Yes, there was. I don't think it was very successful. See, there's a there's a, there's three biography. Well, there's her biography, um, autobiography, Black Beach and Honeydew, which is. 
it's interesting, even in the revised version, she's not given away any secrets. Um, and then there's two others, Margaret Lewis's and Joe can't remember her surname. That's terrible. I'm just going to, no, no, I, I can't find it on my um, bookshelves. Anyway, they talk a little bit about this. There was at least one. It did all right, but not as well as she wanted it to. Anyway, I could be totally wrong, um, and your listeners will know much better than me, and they'll know when it was, and they'll know who starred in it. Well, there have been, been adaptations, obviously. I mean, very successful ones to the screen. I mean, uh, I mean I'm mean, i trying to think of actors, but Patrick Malahide. Uh, yep. I think Simon and Williams uh, did it yes. in, the, in, the, well, in, the, in the pilot. Apparently Simon Williams, who I think looks more like my dream of what Alan might look like, um, only did the, the pilot or the first episode. That's right. Yes, he did. It was available for the rest. Um, George Baker did some as well. I think it was George Baker. Yeah. Um, the Malahide ones are good, although I I don't I just don't think he's good looking enough. And he's a really brilliant actor. But you know she's so passionate about how beautiful Alan is, and uh, there's not a lot of actors who could fulfil that brief. Um, and Malahide's a fantastically strong actor but he he's not well he's not tall enough i mean you know most telly actors aren't that tall <laughs> tell and me she, about it <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, she's she's a, a she was a, a very tall woman herself and i think that's why she made alan so tall and so beautifully imposing in his monkish asceticism um, oh, I love that. I mean, this is something that comes up on the podcast a lot, but, but people talking about adaptations, be the screen or or even yeah. on, on radio, because I think Jeremy Clyde played uh, Alan on, on the BBC radio. And, of course, people re reading a, a book have very much their own image, as you have, uh, 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 of Alan. And it doesn't take much to actually destroy that image and, and the mm. whole world if you're faced with a face and a voice or, or, or not tall enough or good-looking enough or whatever that really doesn't fit. So you just won't watch. Will I you? know it's, it's 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 really difficult, and um, that I think it's Belinda Lang who played Troy in that that's series. It. She doesn't look like my Troy because my Troy doesn't have curly hair. I mean, that's how absurd it is that we <laughs> that we that we have characters that we believe we know what they're like. You know, um, my Troy probably looks a lot more like Naya Marsh, and I think I think Naya Marsh's Troy probably looks like Naya Marsh as well because I think she quite. I think I think if we. If, if there's any character who has um, Marsh in her, it, it's Troy. You know, she, yes. she's, she's writing about herself very clearly there. So on to um, Money in the Morgue. Uh, tell me a bit more about that. What's the, the kind of the, the setup for that then? Well, I mean, she, she gave it a fantastic setup, basically. Um, it's a hospital. Um, I've set it on the Canterbury Plains because I thought that was, she was from Christchurch, she loved the Plains, and I wanted to do it. As an, as an homage to her for that. She had set it actually closer to Dunedin and a different, um, she set it at Mount Gold, which she drove to from Ogg's Corner, which was outside Dunedin, but now it's very much in Dunedin. Um, and, uh, but I changed the, the mountain and the plains and I made it Mount Seeger, which is named after her grandfather. But you'd have to, you'd have to know about Niomars to know that, but now, now your listeners do. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I said on the plains, so I could write about the plains and the Alps, which she writes about very beautifully in Black Beach and Honeydew. And one of the things I wanted to do in getting this as right as I could was to try and bring a sense of her, not just her own writing of the novels, but how she writes about New Zealand herself in Black Beach and Honeydew. So there's some things in the book now, in Money in the Mall, that are, that are taken from her attitude to the land um, in, in her autobiography. So there was that, there was a matron, there was a grumpy sister comfort. Um, so you already you've got two older women, um, uh, which is a very, very classic um, Naya Marsh trope, I think the posh people who have degrees in these things say. Um, and then there was Mr. Glossop and she'd written Mr. Glossop and he's fat and he's sweating and he's difficult and he fancies the matron. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, she'd also written, um, you know, her lovely, uh, there's always one lovely young woman with a broken heart. So that's Sarah Warren, the ingenue. And, um, and a young woman who's not an ingenue because she's be been behaving far too badly. And there's a phrase in Money in the Morgue, which is absolutely not mine. I had to look it up. Um, my mum would have known. Both my parents were 18 and 39. They were um, a bit younger than her, but not an awful lot. And um, uh the phrase is doing a spot of the old bonnet and windmill um 
which apparently <laughs> is, is a phrase referring to Don Juan. Um, uh, oh, well, I don't know. It, no, it's what Don Juan. Who's, who's the Pancho Sanza and the windmill? Don Quixote. Don Quixote. Throwing his bonnet over the windmill or something like that. Anyway, oh. it means shagging. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I, obviously I kept things like that in. And, and there were only three and a half chapters worth of that. Um, so then I had to follow the characters on. But, you know, that's a really lovely lead. And you've got somebody with an awful lot of money, Mr Glossop, who, who's got a flat tyre, can't get anywhere. It's way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, there, there's a one, one older woman he fancies, one older woman he dislikes on sight and she dislikes him on sight. And these two young women who clearly have to fancy the same doctor. I mean, really, it would be stupid if they didn't. <laughs> well, you've um, what, you've convinced what, me. What, it, it, it sounds absolutely uh, uh, wonderful, and I, I I haven't read it yet, but I I certainly am going to read it uh, immediately. Uh, but also in this week, Stella, c- huge congratulations! Your psychological thriller, The Hidden Room, has made the long list of the Neo Marsh uh, Awards uh, for for 2018. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yes, well, the hidden, I haven't written a crime novel since, um, I think, 2006 or 2007. And um, I've done a couple of historical novels, the books about the Empress Theodora, um, some contemporary literary gritty South London fiction, yes. and, then, and then another historical novel set in 1912 in South London. Um, I live in South London. I love South London. Um, and uh, And then I had a crime idea. And... And I, you know, I, I am the despair of my publishers because I am simply not capable of doing. So if people like something, you know, what, what what readers like is that you do another version of what you did before, make it different enough for it to be a new story, but make it the same enough for them to be pleased that they've got you. Well, mm. I'm I'm rubbish at that. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, um, I, I, I really am rubbish at it. I just can't do the same, you know, I I'm just not capable of, 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 even with the same characters, actually, even when I had a crime series, they were always doing, she was always doing quite different things. Anyway, point is, I had a, um, yeah, a family thriller idea. And I do like a good cult. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll put a cult together with a family and it's set in, um, the Fens, um, in modern day, but it's set in the desert in America in the seventies and eighties. So you've got one lot of arid, dry flat land and one lot of watery, wide flat land. And I think I've always been interested in secrets more than anything else, including in my literary fiction. So secrets and lies uh, are my big thing. And I think that shows in everything I've written. Um, And so this one's a very big secret from the past that, like all big secrets from the past, come back to haunt us. Um, And it's um, what was really funny for that is it has a um, a, a same-sex couple, a lesbian couple of mothers. And uh, all the reviews have been very kind. And they said things like, "Um, Laurie and Martha are a very happy couple and their children are great until this happens. And they think, or Laurie and Martha live in the fens and everything's lovely until this happens. And brilliantly, the Dear Daily Mail, I guess because they didn't want to upset their readers or get their readers accidentally buying a book with some lesbians in it, um, <laughs> said, uh, Laurie and Martha, same-sex couple, are oh. very happy. And, and they're, they're the only review that referred to that because it's not the plot has nothing to do with their sexuality or, or them being two women. Oh. That's irrelevant. Well, why point it out then? Yeah. I know, I just thought, I thought, I thought it was so funny of them. And, you know, yeah. I mean, and typical, I perhaps. Yeah, I, exactly. I don't have the politics of the Daily Mail, but as any writer knows, they do help us sell books, um, <laughs> one way or another. Yeah. And, and, and we don't want we don't want readers buying a book and going, "Oh my God, they're lesbians! I can't read it." <laughs> um, or actually, maybe I do want them buying it as long as they buy it. But I mean, the other thing that, ha- that happened this week um, uh, is that um, Money in the Morgues on the long list for the historical dagger. Oh wow! Well, Congratulations. Congratulations! That's, cr- right. That's the sort of week writers like. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad week, Stella, is it? It is. It's a, it's a very nice week. Um, I've never had a week like it. I've also never had a book nominated for the Big Dagger. I've got two short story daggers, which are gorgeous, but I've never had a, a book on the list for the for a Big Dagger. So um, I'm really chuffed about that. Oh, huge and- congratulations! That's fantastic Thank news. You.
Yeah, thank you. It, it feels really lovely, particularly for this. And, and what's really cool is that in the listings, it says, um, it's you know, so they've got the 10 of, of each, and then it goes to the historical dagger, and it says, by Nio Marsh and Stella Duffy, because it is. But it, I just really like that, that, you know, so long after her death, she gets to be nominated for a prize. It's really cool. It is cool. And I, it goes to show what a fantastic book it is as well and um, and, and, the, and the great work you've done. It's um, Well, it really is. And I've got one last question, if I may, Stella. Yes. You're a theatre maker of of, of, of of much distinction. What's your next theatre piece? Oh, well, I haven't actually... Um, oh, I'm about to lie. I said I was about to say I haven't actually got anything, but I have. Um, I've got two <laughs> things. <laughs> One is um, a, a very short five to ten minute opera that I'm writing the libretto for for wow. Tate, Tate for next year. I've done a couple of short, tiny operas for them before. Um, Joanne Harris has done some. Tate Tate Tate's an amazing company. They do they do little operas and they put them on the street with two singers and two musicians and people can just see them as they pass by. And for people like me who didn't grow up with opera, whose family didn't get it, didn't go to it. I mean, you know, white working class family it wasn't in my parents' background either. So it just wasn't for us. So for someone like me, it's, it's a really accessible, brilliant way to, to be doing that. And then um, I have a play which I wrote a couple of years ago and I'm doing some more work on this year that is hopefully going on tour next year. It's called The Matilda Effect, and it's about women and science and all those women in science um, who have been forgotten or neglected and who made wonderful contributions and are all too often talked about as victims. I mean, you know, no one ever talks about the amazing discoveries that Rosalind Franklin made and how fantastic she was and how successful she was. All they ever talk about is, oh, no, she didn't get the prize because she died before um, they were awarded the prize for the D for DNA. Well, she couldn't get it because she was dead. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, she was massively successful in her lifetime. So... Rather than writing a play about the, you know, women yet, you know, women scientists basically being Sylvia Plath, which is all everyone ever wants, you know, women with a rotten life and a horrible death. And that's not true of Sylvia Plath either. Um, what I'm trying to write is, is a very positive piece about, about women, some of whom have been forgotten, some of whom are remembered, but they're remembered for their victimhood and their victim status, not for their strength and their brilliance. Wow. Well, wow. it just goes to show what um, a powerhouse, a, yeah, talented <laughs> and diverse you are, person. I'm, I'm, I would really keep an eye out for both those uh, those performances. They sound absolutely extraordinary. And for Money in the Morgue, which is um, out now in hardcover and ebook and in paperback next March, I believe, is it still? Yeah, paperback next March. Fantastic. Well, uh, we'll tell everyone to uh, to rush out and get that. Stella, thank you very much for joining yes, us today. Thank you, Stella. Thank you. It's been smashing. <laughs> thank you Brilliant. very much thank indeed. You. <laughs> What a, a fantastically eloquent speaker. She's a, a an absolute powerhouse. Well, as <laughs> we said, she she certainly is. And uh, what, a, what a great interview. Um, I mean, gosh, talk about talent. And what a week, as we say. I mean, you mm. know, two, two, two nominations, books. I mean, that's, that's great. And that's before you even start talking about uh, her, her theatre work. Uh, yes, um, uh, the great Stella uh, Duffy. And, Stella uh, Duffy, OBE. Yeah. Aren't, aren't we, we're honoured to have her on the show. She's... Um, yeah, just fantastically talented in many ways. It makes me insanely jealous as somebody who, who writes a bit of crime and has a bit of an interest in the theatre. It's the kind of person that uh, I look up to with uh, with awe and more than a hint of jealousy. Yes, same here. <laughs> yes, well, if you want to get hold of that book, um, Murder in the uh, Money in the Morgue, I should, should at Money least get that right, morgue. shouldn't I? Money in the Morgue, uh, head over to Kobo.com. It is available there, and you can get 90% off, uh, which brings the price down to a rather reasonable level, I think, uh, by entering the promo code CRIME at the checkout at Kobo.com. And the audiobook of Money in the Morgue is also available on Kobo's new audiobook platform. So uh, if audiobooks are your thing, if you're an audio person, which... I presume you may well be listening to a podcast. Then uh, head over there and check out the audiobook. Well, I feel as I've spent some considerable time pleasantly in New Zealand, mm. listening to all the dark and 
dastardly deeds. I've, I've never on. been, but I feel like I no, have. No, I'd now. love to go over there. I've got relations over there. I've ne- we've ne- never gone. My my great great uncle went over there, you know, beginning of the, the last century, and, and did very well for himself. And uh, so I've got lots of cousins and what have you. And I'd love to go. I'd love to go and work there. Mm. Uh, but I, it's a it's a beautiful country. Are you angling for a part in Lord of the Rings? Uh, well, are they still making that? <laughs> probably. I mean, yeah, I don't so, know. I'll probably be. I'll probably be doing the the, the spoof. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of a spoof title. There. Yes, it didn't didn't get one quickly enough. Not one that was clean yes, for yes. The, clean enough for the podcast. Yes, Baronet you know. of the Key Rings. That will do. That will do. <laughs> on on which note, speaking of that will do, that will do. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Bache. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, Perfected. Perfected.